then we uh, can start our session for today, which is about the languages under discussion. Last time uh, we spoke about the mini family of Japanese, Japonic, but today we will also discuss Koreanic, uh, Tungusic, Mongolic, and Turkic languages. So our, in our general schedule, this is the third session. In the first session, we uh, came with an introduction. And then uh, last time, we discussed uh, the whole debate on the origins of Japanese. And today, uh, we will uh, speak about uh, Korean, Tungusic, Mongolic, and uh, Turkic languages. And then for next time, uh, we will discuss the establishment of language relatedness. So that will be a more methodological course. And then we will move into the comparative evidence for Japanese. And uh, we will also uh, sketch Japanese as a, a language of the trans-Eurasian structural type. And then in the uh, classes in 2021, uh, we will turn to a more interdisciplinary question with the peopling of Japan and inferences about the Japanese past. And then after that, we will have the student uh, presentations. Last uh, uh, lesson. Uh, first, maybe a question for Elias. Uh, do you remember, Elias, what the difference is between linguistic borrowing and inheritance? And can you give an example? Um, linguistic borrowing would mean there's some kind of language contact between languages that aren't necessarily related. So the common contact, and you kind of showed it on a horizontal scale where it moves this way. Um, and if there is language inheritance, you would have some kind of common ancestor and the languages use similar words maybe because they're related in the past. Yes, indeed, that's correct. It's interesting that you use the terms horizontal and uh, vertical. That's also how in biology and other sciences it's approached. We speak of a horizontal transmission uh, for borrowing and then vertical transmission for inheritance because that would be inherited uh, from a common ancestor. Uh, thank you very much. And then, uh, um, stages of development of the trans-Eurasian affiliation hypothesis over the last centuries. We uh, spoke about these curves. I think we started with the Tar Tar family. Yes. Um, and then Ural Altaic. Mm -hmm. Altaic and then trans-Eurasian, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, that's okay, also yeah. the project. <laughs> Indeed, we, we started with uh, the theories that were like macro family theories, big uh, families like Tatar, as you say, or like Ural Altaic. And then uh, we went to the micro Altaic, Tunguzic, uh, Mongolic, and uh, Turkic. And then again, we added uh, Japanese and Koreans, so macro. And then uh, we went to the trans Eurasian stage where we also had more. Um, a focus on borrowing and or the interaction between borrowing and inheritance. Thank you very much. And then uh, uh, for Joshua at Ziegler, uh, what are the main objections that were raised in the past against uh, Japanese relatedness with trans-Eurasian? Do you remember that? Um, I'm guessing no common vocabulary especially like basic vocabulary as such as body parts and probably um, morphology and syntax differences. Yes, exactly. Uh, so basic vocabulary, uh, and that was also connected with the idea that much was probably borrowed, that the similarities were due to borrowing rather than uh, inheritance. And morphology, as you say, is also an important point. The fact that uh, uh, it was said that there were not a an sufficient building stones of, of words and, and uh, grammatical bu building stones shared between these languages. And then, thank you. Um, and then for the next uh, person, uh, Julia Le uh, Ledig, uh, what are the four main periods in the history of Japanese? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you very well. 
as I'm having problems with my internet connection. Okay. Um, but the four main periods would be old Japanese, yeah. early middle Japanese, late middle Japanese, and modern Japanese. Thank you very much. That's uh, correct. Then we uh, can move on to some polling. Uh, can you tell me when did the first substantial written records uh, for Japanese appear? Was that in the 3rd uh, century, the 8th century, or the 16th century? Okay, uh, most uh, people have the correct answer. It's indeed in the 8th century. Uh, it would be nice if we had them from the 3rd century. It would bring us back earlier in history, but unfortunately, uh, that's not uh, the case. So that's also one of the issues that uh, yeah, is a difficulty in establishing trans-Eurasian relatedness. If you compare, for instance, to Indo-European relatedness, in Indo-European, you have sources that go back to, say, 1500 uh, BC, like with Hittite or Sanskrit, 1000 BC. While uh, in for the trans-Eurasian uh, languages or written sources are, unfortunately, uh, much later. About uh, Ainu, is Ainu genealogically related to Japanese and the Ryukyuan languages? Is it uh, genealogically unrelated to Japanese but related to Ryukyuan, or is it an isolate language? And here to all people have the uh, right answer. It is indeed uh, SOV. Uh, most uh, languages have either SOV or SVO. So SOV are languages like Japanese and, and the other trans-Eurasian languages, but also Latin and Hungarian and, and Sanskrit. SVO is many languages in Europe, but for instance, also Swahili. And then uh, few la fewer languages have VSO like Welsh or Arabic and Hawaiian. And then the other combinations, VOS, OVS, and OSV are, are very few across the languages of the world. So altogether, there, there are only six ways to arrange uh, S, O, and V in a sentence. So it is, of course, not. it can be coincidental that just a group of languages shares the same uh, combination. It does not necessarily mean to to mean that there's a reason, a historical reason for that. It does not need to mean that they are genealogically related. It can just be yeah, coincidence uh, because there are many languages across the world and only few ways uh, to put SOV in a row. So that brings us uh, to the topic of today. Uh, we will first uh, deal with Korean, the Koreanic uh, family. And when we speak of uh, uh, Korean today, we mean one single language. There is only one single Korean language uh, spoken today. However, that has not always been that way. In the past, about 1,500 years ago, different languages were spoken on the Korean peninsula. So you had a, a big uh, group of uh, Puyo uh, languages, mainly Koguryo, spoken in North Korea, but also in uh, Northeast China, the, the Jilin uh, province may, maybe, and uh, the island of, uh, uh, or the, the, the Liaodong Peninsula. And then you had in the south of Korea a number of uh, languages uh, like Pegje, Shila, and Kaya that... Uh, Corresponded uh, to the languages of uh, the of, ki of the kingdoms of Pegje, Shila, Shila, Shila and Kaya. Uh, in uh, 686, uh, Shila, the kingdom of Shila, unified uh, the Korean Peninsula, and it unified it not only in a political sense but also in a linguistic sense. 
So that means that uh, all other languages, Gaia, Pegje, and Koguryo, got extinct. Many people speaking Pegje, Gaia, or Koguryo adopted uh, the Shila language. Others just fled uh, for political re uh, reasons. So there were many Pegje and Koguryo refugees, for instance, in the 6th and 7th centuries that went uh, to Japan. And uh, as these refugees went to Japan, there was also a lot of borrowing uh, going on there on the Japanese islands between the language of the refugees and uh, the people present there speaking old Japanese uh, at that time. So uh, this brings us uh, uh, to the periodization of uh, Korean. Uh, we make uh, a bit similar to the periodization of Japanese. We have a, a number of periods, uh, starting with, with Old Korean, which is, which is the language that was spoken during the Three Kingdoms uh, period until the Shila rule. Uh, the Three Kingdoms period, as we said, was not only one language, there was also uh, Pegje, there was also Kaya. So if we speak about Old Korean, we all, always need to specify whether it is Shila Old Korean or uh, whether we mean Pegje Old Korean or whether we mean Kaya Old Korean. And then in the uh, subsequent period from 918 to 1443, we speak of Early Middle Korean. And 4042, 1443 is an important turning point. Uh, it is actually the invention of Hangul. Does uh, somebody know what uh, Hangul is? Um, uh, Shi Huang, do you know what uh, Hangul is? No, I have no idea what it is. Are there people uh, studying Korean? Elias, I think you are studying Korean, yeah? Uh, do you know what Hangul is? Yeah, Hangul is basically the Korean alphabet, and you can use it to basically write words phonetically and not with like Chinese characters. Exactly. Uh, it's a bit strange. You could think that uh, the invention of a script, the Hangul script, marked uh, the transition of a, a period uh, in uh, the Korean language. It's, of course, the invention of the script does not change the language, it just changes our understanding of the language. And that's also why it is used uh, as a marking point. Because before, in the early Middle Korean period, uh, we have uh, literature written in Korean, but uh, the script used is Chinese script. And it is very difficult uh, to decipher uh, and to really interpret uh, the, the Chinese script and to really understand what is meant, uh, what pronunciation, what phonetics and what meanings are meant. So it's still a bit uh, speculative. Uh, after the invention of Hangul, however, everything becomes clear and we have a clear non-speculative access uh, to the older uh, stages of Korean. So from Hangul onwards, we speak about late Middle Korean uh, until the Imjin Wars, which are the wars when uh, Hideyoshi, uh, a Japanese uh, warlord, comes to Korea. Uh, that's the period of late Middle Korean and then modern Korean until the 20th century. And then from the 20th century onwards, we speak of uh, contemporary Korean. Interestingly, uh, there is a very rich uh, Korean literature written in Chinese characters uh, already before uh, uh, late Middle Korean, so early, already in early Middle Korean. And there was also a printing of books in Korea already in the 14th century. So the Koreans already have had the metal uh, movable uh, type and uh, that was 73 years before Gutenberg. So it's, it is often said that uh, Gutenberg was the first with his uh, uh, movable metal, uh, metal type. Uh, that is true for Europe. He was the first to introduce it in uh, Europe. But long before Gutenberg, uh, people were already printing uh, with uh, movable uh, metal type, as you can see. Uh, and here we have uh, King Sejong. 
King Sejong, who uh, was the king who made sure that in uh, 1446, uh, the uh, pro- proclamation of the Hangul script uh, could take place. It is often said that uh, King Sejong is the inventor of the Hangul script. Of course, he did not invent it uh, himself. He was certainly helped with uh, linguists uh, in his team, but he had a keen interest uh, in language, uh, that is for sure. He, it is often said that uh, this uh, Hangul script is one of the most efficient scripts uh, across the world and uh, that you can really learn it in uh, one morning. When I uh, visited uh, Korea a while ago, they were like, uh, wait, I never know which direction I have to go out here. Uh, they had these books for tourists, folders, uh, you can learn the Korean alphabet in one morning. And here it's like explained how you can read, how you can learn Korean in the morning. It's really very simple and very efficient uh, uh, alphabet, much more efficient than, for example, the Japanese script, where uh, you have to learn for ages and still uh, you're not competent because you have uh, this hiragana and katakana and then you have the kanji. It's a lot uh, to learn. The sources of uh, Middle Korean, you have early uh, Middle Korean, uh, as we said, and there uh, there are some important sources like the Kirimusa, the legend of the cock forest, or the uh, Hyangyak uh, Kugupang, which is a, a pharmaceutical uh, work on, on the use of plants uh, for medicine. Uh, these are written in Chinese characters and not entirely clear, um, uh, as far as what Korean they, they express exactly, then it, you have this turn uh, with Hangul, and then you have a lot of late Middle Korean literature, starting with the Hunmin Chongum, uh, the proclamation of the uh, correct sounds for the people, the, the script, and then followed by a number of work, words, uh, works on a Buddha's life and, and on poetry. As far as the classification of Korean uh, is concerned, uh, An and Jong, uh, in this book, uh, there is, an, uh, there is a, an article by An and Jong on the classification of Korean. And they uh, classify the Korean uh, dialects, as you can see, in a number of branches. All these uh, dialects are very close uh, to one uh, another. They're all real dialects, mutually intelligible, with only one exception, and that is the Chechu language. And the Chechu language is spoken here on uh, Chechu Island. And there, uh, some people have proposed that uh, Chechu is a different language, a kind of second Koreanic language, because it is quite divergent uh, from standard Korean to such an extent that some people say that it's not mutually intelligible, but it's a bit on the verge. Of course, due to this uh, Shilla unification, Korean went through a kind of bottleneck. All the sisters of Korean died out. They all got extinct. So uh, Korean is, goes back to Middle Korean, and Middle Korean goes back to Shilla Korean. So all Korean we know today goes back to Shilla Korean, and we have no uh, Pegje Korean left, we have no uh, Kaya Korean left. And that is why when we compare these languages and we try to reconstruct the common ancestor, we can only go back one millennium in time. Because we lack these other deeper languages like Pegje and Kaya, we cannot go back any further uh, in time. And that is a real shortcoming uh, for uh, comparative historical linguistics. But this uh, the data we have to do with. There's nothing to do about that. Here you see a, a classification of Korean. Uh, you have Korean and all the Korean dialects here, goes back to Middle Korean, goes back to uh, Shilla Korean, goes back uh, these uh, languages of the Shilla kingdom in the Chinhan province. And then uh, you have the Pyonhan uh, uh, province in uh, the, the mid-south uh, of Korea, 
with the Kaya languages, and then you have the Mahan province with the Pegji languages in the uh, southwest uh, of Korea. But unfortunately, these two branches died out. Uh, there are also, we also spoke about Koguryo and the Puyo languages, which covered uh, North Korea before. Interestingly, uh, we have a few relics left uh, from Koguryo uh, language. For instance, one stone steel that was discovered in the Chinese province of uh, Jilin, and uh, also some uh, toponyms that were preserved in a 13th century source, the Samguk Sagi. Uh, the source is 13th century, but it reports on a name change that took place in the 7th century when Koguryo place names were changed into Chinese on, under uh, the Shila king. So uh, this Koguryo language, when we inspect it and when we study the little remnants we have from it, it seems that it is much closer uh, to Japanese than it is uh, to Korean. So it looks as if it is Japanic or Japonic rather than uh, Koreanic. Uh, Christopher Beckwith uh, wrote an interesting book about uh, Koguryo and, and Japonic, uh, uh, which was published uh, with Brill. And there's also this uh, relationship of, uh, between Koguryo and Japanese and the remnants of Koguryo could be an interesting topic of, uh, for your uh, presentation. So whereas uh, Koguryo was closer to Japanese, Pegje and Kaya uh, was closer uh, to Korean. Then the structure of uh, Korean is uh, reminiscent of the structure of uh, Japanese, at least broadly. Uh, we have an agglutinative language. Uh, you can say things in Korean as kashio uh, kesumnika, would he have gone? And that's one string of morphemes. So one morpheme glued after the other, so agglutinative. Here too, Ramon, uh, you see you have this uh, honorific uh, she in Korean and uh, a polite uh, soup. Again, there's the same uh, system as in Japanese, honorification uh, depends on the rank of the speaker, whether the person you're addressing is higher in rank or lower in rank, and politeness uh, depends on the formality of the situation. So the parameters are uh, very similar as in Japanese. The only thing is that here, this uh, politeness, in Japanese you have uh, two politeness levels, like uh, informal and formal, formal, but in Korean, you have as much as six politeness uh, levels, which makes this, which makes it uh, very complex. So you have to sense the formality of the situation. But there is gradually there are six different different levels of uh, formality. Then uh, the morphological structure of Korean is just like Japanese, again, uh, dependent marking, which means that uh, possession is marked on the dependent, not on the head. So it goes uh, with uh, Japanese and not uh, with Ainu. And then uh, the syntactic structure is again SOV. And uh, there we have a number of uh, implicational uh, tendencies. Like, uh, uh, this is, I think it was Elias, but maybe it was Ramon who, who uh, told me that it's, that was Elias, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, Elias made remark uh, last time, yes, but it would be more correct in English uh, to say the cat's fish. Uh, that is uh, indeed so. But just for the sake of the argument and for showing that SVO, the cat eats fish, has implicational tendencies. The tendency is that if you have an SVO language, you use uh, prepositions. And the tendency is that the genitive will, will be behind the noun, although in some cases, like in English, preference is given to the other construction. And then also that uh, auxiliaries precede the verb that are implicational tendencies of SVO. In SOV, it's the other way around. And that is also what we see in uh, Korean. So, uh, the cat fish eats is again SOV. You use postpositions. Jip is house and is saw is in. 
Guy Pesson is in the house, so the uh, the inn is, is behind the house. And then Koyang Yi Mulgogi, uh, the cat's uh, fish, uh, just like uh, in uh, uh, Jap- Japanese neko no sakana. And then the uh, Koyangi ga moko ita, the cat is eating. Mokita is the verb uh, for eat, and ita is uh, to be. Uh, and uh, the auxiliary comes in the second uh, position. So again, all these implicational tendencies are there too. That brings us uh, to our reading. Uh, uh, John Whitman's uh, The Relationship Between Japanese and Korean. This was a rather technical uh, paper, but I still wanted to show it to you just that you have the flavor of how this field of historical comparative linguistics really works. Uh, Maybe we can uh, do a a poll. Um, If you... If you have uh, read the paper, uh, you can uh, say A. And if you did not read it, then please uh, B. Okay, I uh, polled the results. Uh, uh, Joshua and uh, Kevin did not reply, but then I uh, suppose it's also not read. Uh, but still, it's nice to see that as many as eight uh, uh, people read the paper, uh, which is, of course, uh, very good. Thanks for that. Then uh, the abbreviations. Uh, PGR and PK. Uh, Ramon, can you say what they stand for? Ramon, can you hear me? Yeah, I don't know the answer right now. Sorry. Uh, a P, uh, maybe somebody can uh, help. Uh, wait, I, it's the ancestral language of uh, Jap- the Japan the Japanese and Rukyun language and the ancestor of uh, the Korean languages or language. Uh, Again, what was the main objection against the genealogical relatedness of uh, Japanese and Korean uh, that was uh, found by the author? Uh, Elias, can you answer that? Um, Not really, sorry. (laughs) It's basically the same as this, the same objection as turns uh, up always. It's always the same and the same. Do you? What is the main objection so far that we uh, that we presented? The main objection raised. Uh, um, main, yeah. We've had issues with basic vocabulary that doesn't overlap as much as we would need it to. Exactly, the basic vocabulary and the borrowing. So that are two arguments that that come together. So there's not enough basic vocabulary shared, and we think that a lot of the vocabulary uh, is borrowed. It was all a bit hidden in a lot of technical talk, but uh, the author uses a criterion or proposes to use a criterion to distinguish between inherited words and borrowed words. It's based on an observation in Japanese. Uh, does somebody uh, know? It's a difficult question. Uh, Charlene, do you know that? Um, I'm not quite sure, but I think it's where he was talking about uh, Volvin's, the other author's conclusion about using the, um, what was it called? The, uh, the six reliable cognates and the 75 obvious loan words. Yes. I didn't completely understand what he was trying to say. Yes. Um, this, uh, the, the point was that if we want to distinguish the inherited word from the borrowed words between Japanese and Korean, We could just look at words in Old Japanese. And if the Old Japanese words have a cognate in Ryukyuan, 
then they are probably inherited. If they have no cognate in Ryukyuan, they are probably borrowed from Korean because it's a matter of timing. If if they have a, 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 a cognate or a similar word in Ryukyuan, it means they go back to Proto-Japonic early in time. Well, when they have no such cognate in Ryukyuan, they are probably not going back to pro- Proto-Japonic, but suddenly appeared in Old Japanese. And the reason that they suddenly appeared in Old Japanese is probably because of these Pegje and uh, uh, Kaya people migrating uh, to Japan in the 6th and 7th centuries. So that's how a criterion for distinguishing inheritance from and borrowing was uh, proposed. So look at cognates. You have uh, Old Japanese. Is the word not attested in Old Japanese? Or is it not attested in Ryukyu? And then it's a borrowing. Is it attested uh, in Ryukyu? And then it's probably inherited. But I admit that it was a bit difficult uh, to find the arguments because, uh, between all the uh, technical lingo so um, the next question uh, would be, at which level of language structure does the author find evidence for relatedness between Japanese and Korean? Which levels of language, which parts of language uh, does he look at in general? Uh, Joshua, do you know the answer to that? Uh, for, on a phonological level? Yes. Yeah. And what, what else? That's the only only one I remember. Okay. Yeah, he looks at the phonological level, but also at the grammatical level, the level of morphemes. And then he looks at the lexical level, the level of words. Like, for instance, he looks at numerals. He looks at uh, personal pronouns, but he also looks at basic vocabulary. So he uses a lot of different parts of language to uh, build his argumentation. Um, he also refers uh, to the fact that our historical information on Korean is more shallow than that of Japanese. That relates a bit uh, to what we have just uh, discussed. Uh, Yulia, uh, can you explain that? In what sense our historical information on Korean is more shallow than uh, of Japanese? Uh, yeah, I read the text, but I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah. Maybe that's got to do with uh, the lack of sources, or that uh, first uh, in the beginning um, Chinese scripture was used, and that's rather it's rather difficult to establish phonolo- phonological um, correspondences. That way. Exactly, that's uh, uh, certainly a good point. Uh, the historical information on Korean is less because we only have the first unambiguous uh, sources. Uh, from the 15th century, while from ja- for Japanese, that's already from the 8th century onwards. And also, of course, because Korean went through this bo- bottleneck with Shila unifying the peninsula, all other languages got lost. Well, that was not the case for Japanese, where we, for instance, still have the Ryukyuan languages that can help us reconstruct Japanese back in time. Uh, which uh, Japanese numerals are formed through an ancient doubling game. That's a a little detail, and maybe, uh, Damaris, can you help? Can you, uh, do you remember that? This is uh, something that is not uh, found in other trans-Eurasian languages, maybe a little trace of Korean, but not really. but uh, it might be present in some polysynthetic language languages, uh, these isolates that you find on the um, Asian Pacific coast. So uh, some languages, like uh, uh, languages spoken on Kamchatka, Koryak, the, Chum, the, the, Chuk, the, the Chukchi Kamchatkan languages, the um, uh, Amuric, Nifk language, and Ainu, uh, might have a trace of this too. So it could be some substratum of underlying languages that were spoken in the area before Japanese uh, arrived uh, there. But that is not uh, sure, of course. That is only speculation. Do you remember whether there is a trace of such a doubling uh, system in Korean as well? Uh, 
maybe uh, Kevin, do you remember that? Uh, no, sorry, I don't remember. He mentioned a small trace, but it's a bit on the edge. He said you have in Korean uh, the number two is tul, and the uh, tul and the and it comes from tubul. In uh, f the four is net, and it comes from ye. So yodul could be a two times four construction uh, in Korean, but that is a bit uh, insecure. And nevertheless, I think that the numerals and, the, and their origins could also make a nice topic, a diachronic uh, topic uh, for a presentation. I have a question. Yes, uh, Charlene. Um, I don't quite understand how these comparisons are made because it says the Japanese and Korean numerals, but the ones we discussed here, Hito, Mi, and Yotsu, and so forth, are usually used for counting things rather when you only look at the numbers it's ichi ni san yon and so forth so is it fair to apply this to all numerals or am i understanding it wrong that, i just don't know why it's just using the counter numerals that's a very good question and it relates to some extent to a question that uh, she uh, huang asked uh, last time uh, it's about uh, the origins of the japanese numerals uh, it's very interesting if we look at Japanese that we have two numeral systems. We have the numeral system, as you said, that is like only a very, that became very mar marginal, hitotsu, futatsu, mitsu, yotsu. Um, and we have the numeral system that today is more common, ichi, ni, san, shi, go, etc. The thing is that this more common numeral system uh, has been introduced quite late in Japanese. In old Japanese, this numeral system was not present yet. It only entered Japanese at the time of Middle Japanese. So it is a, a system that got borrowed from Chinese. Uh, you have the same numerals in Chinese. And the, the more relic system, the more ancient system, is the older system, that's the Hitotsu, Futatsu, Mitsu, uh, etc. system. And that uh, system got pushed a bit towards the periphery. Uh, but it's still present and it's still a relic of the older system. So that's why it's fair, so to say, to use only that system because that's not borrowed and the other one is borrowed. That's again this whole question of distinguishing between borrowing and inheritance, but a very good remark. Thank you. And now uh, we can uh, continue with uh, the Tunguzic family. Uh, so we saw Japanese and Korean, and then the third language group we're going to uh, compare these languages to is uh, Tunguzic. And uh, Tunguzic uh, is a large family, actually, but it's, it's, it's only, it's an endangered language family. The languages, the Tunguzic languages are only spoken by very few people. And uh, it's the language family that we find in uh, uh, northern uh, Siberia, in the Russian Far East, uh, also in uh, Inner Mongolia, in, in Northeast uh, China, and near Lake Baikal. Um, so uh, the Tunguzic languages are, there are about 12 Tunguzic uh, languages, and they have three branches. There is the Manchuric branch, which you see here uh, in yellow, uh, the most well-known uh, branch, uh, the most well-known language of the Manchuric branch is probably Manchu itself. Manchu uh, was the language of uh, a complete Chinese uh, dynasty, the Xin uh, uh, dynasty that existed between 1644 and 1911. So it ruled over China. The rulers uh, at that time uh, spoke Manchu and they used uh, also Manchu for their as an official language in the official uh, documents. Uh, the the uh, ancestors of the Manchu were the Jurchen. Jurchen is no longer spoken today, but uh, Jurchen uh, was the language of the Yin dynasty in the 12th century and also um, uh, the Yin dynasty ruled over North uh, China and th these people too were Tunguzic speakers not no Sino-Tibetan or Sinitic speakers interestingly there's one 
So Manchu has only 50 uh, speakers left. And even in the case of these 50 speakers, it's not entirely clear whether they are real native speakers or not. It would rather seem that they are uh, like uh, ethnic Manchu, people with a Manchu ethnical background who still claim to know Manchu language, but it's not their first language. It's more like a second uh, language. For Shibe, that is different. Uh, Shibe is a dialect of Manchu. It uh, is a group of people that got deported, I think, in the 17th or 18th century to Xinjiang in West uh, China, and they uh, they spe still speak Manchu or a dialect of Manchu today. And here, uh, this is a, a larger uh, group of people in Xinjiang. We, uh, apart from the Manchuric branch, we then have the Tunguzic branch proper that consists of southern Tunguzic languages, which you see here in red, and then a group of northern uh, Tunguzic languages in blue. Uh, Even uh, is uh, a language spoken by reindeer, reindeer herders uh, near Yakutsk and, and, and here on the coast. There are more than 5,000 speakers of Even, and there, there are also, uh, for Evenki here on the Baikal, there are thousands of speakers left. Solon too is a big language with uh, about uh, 30,000 uh, speakers le left. This language is spoken in, in China's uh, Inner Mongolia uh, province. However, there are also uh, Tunguzic languages that are near uh, to extinction, like for instance, Negedal, with uh, one about 150 speakers left, or uh, Orok, a language spoken on Kamchatka, where there are probably only 70 speakers left. Uh, last time uh, we spoke about Patrick Servinsky, who uh, teaches uh, Korean at our university, and he, for his doctoral dissertation, is making a language description of this language, Orok, Orok or Wilta. And for this reason, he often goes... Uh, there and uh, to describe uh, the language. For instance, last last winter when Corona started, he was there and he had big uh, trouble uh, getting a flight back, uh, also partly due co to Corona. Uh, the sources uh, for these uh, languages are very few. It's not like with uh, Japanese and Korean that we have these big literary monuments. Uh, only uh, for the Jurchen uh, language, we have some fragmentary attestations from old uh, inscriptions. And then the Manchu language is very well attested uh, because all these official documents in the Xing dynasty were uh, written in, in Manchu. But, that, but there, uh, that is relatively late. It's not really very helpful uh, as an ancient sort because it's only 17th, 18th century. And then uh, for all other Tunguzic languages, we have written sources that only started over the last 150 years. This is an example of a, a Jurchen, such a Jurchen inscription here uh, from a rock uh, that was found uh, on the bank of the river Ar uh, Arkara in the Amur uh, province. Uh, there you find the, a Jurchen inscription from 1127 and uh, the inscription is, is given here. So as you can see here too, as is the case for uh, the older Korean sources, Chinese uh, script is used, and it is used uh, both for its meaning, some characters are used for their meaning, and others are used for their sound, uh, as to give uh, suffixes, for instance. And... Uh, because we know Manchu and Jurchen is the ancestor of Manchu, we can try to decipher uh, these texts with our knowledge of Manchu and with the knowledge of the meaning and the um, pronunciation of the Chinese characters. So this is an, an example. Manchu is the language uh, of the group that is uh, well known uh, for its small feet in, in uh, 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 you probably know this tradition uh, where uh, Chinese little girls got bound feet. That was a typical uh, Manchu tra tradition. So the feet were broken and, and bound uh, together because uh, small feet were considered like cute or, or sexy. 
And then uh, the classification of the Tunguzic languages. Uh, here you see a classification that is also in, in this book, a diachrony of uh, verb morphology uh, in Trans-Eurasian. Here I gave uh, the classifications for the different uh, Trans-Eurasian languages. And I proposed this uh, classification where the uh, uh, Manchuric branch splits off first, and then you have a Tunguzic branch that splits into a southern uh, Tunguzic branch and a northern uh, Tunguzic uh, branch. I was, of course, not the first to come up with this classification. This is more or less the standard view on the classification uh, of uh, Tunguzic. There is a second view uh, that uh, is not is not Manchu Tunguzic, so not Manchu that uh, splits off first. But here there's also a classification that proposes that you have two branches, a northern branch with Evenki, Solan, Negidal and Even, and a southern branch that comprises both the southern Tunguzic languages and the Manchuric uh, languages. But uh, this, is, uh, this is the level of discussion about Tunguzic. In general, all linguists agree that the Tunguzic languages uh, make up a family of their own. So that is totally beyond discussion. The only discussions among uh, the linguists are about the exact classification of the different groups. Here there's also a classification that is uh, that uh, has re recently been proposed by Sonia Oskolskaya on the basis of Bayesian methods. So uh, Bayesian techniques are uh, is a kind of statistics that is used in genetics and in, in evolutionary biology and that has also recently been applied uh, to linguistics. And in this classification, she also uh, uh, she reads, she reaches a classification where there is like a north-south distinction. The northern language is split from the southern languages, and Manchuric splits off later. Uh, and uh, that brings us from the classification uh, to the structure. Again, same old story. Tunguzic is an agglutinative uh, language. Here I have given an example from Nanai, Sea Logo Wankini. And this uh, Sea means to eat. The Lo is an inhoative suffix that means begin something, begin to eat. Go is uh, repetitive again and again or again. Uh, Wang is a causative, make somebody eat again, and uh, ki is a past, mate somebody eat again, and ni is then the third uh, person singular. So this long suffix change, chain means something like she made somebody begin to eat again. It's very reminiscent of these uh, suffixes that are attached one to another uh, in Japanese and Korean. Uh, the morphological marking uh, in Manchu is interestingly dependent marking. So in Manchu, you have constructions like Amai Bo, father's house, with here uh, the genitive marked on the father and not on the house, so on the dependent and not on the head. But all other Tunguzic languages, like even the northern uh, Tunguzic languages, mark uh, the uh, possession on the head. So here you have Svinya. Svinya is a sw swine, and that is a borrowing uh, from Russian. There are no swines in uh, even uh, culture. They came in later through contact with the Russians. Uron um, is uh, meat, and N is the third uh, singular possessive, something like thereof. Swine, meat, thereof. So the, this thereof, this possession is marked on the meat and not on the swine. And that's why it is called head marking. This is true from, for most uh, Tunguzic languages. Personally, I suspect that the Manchu uh, strategy may be the old trans-Eurasian strategy, the conservative strategy, and that these uh, strategies uh, may have come in when uh, people living there before adopted uh, uh, Tunguzic, so that it may be substratum interference from, for instance, uh, speakers of Nifk, 
because in NIF, like in Ainu, it works this way, so that uh, these people shifted to Tunguzik and and uh, and adopted uh, Tunguzik, but used the same uh, structure like in their original language. So substratum interference. It might be that. That's a speculation. That's not sure. Uh, syntactic uh, structure uh, is SOV of uh, Tunguzik, just like for mo most uh, other trans-Eurasian languages. Here, again, my example, the cat eats fish, Uyuri is cat, Nima is fit, uh, fish, and Jembi is uh, eat in the non-past. And uh, that brings us uh, to the Mongolic uh, family. Uh, the Mongolic uh, family is a, a family of languages in Central Asia. We all know Mongolish, Khaga Mongolian, which is spoken not only in the Republic of Mongolia, but also here in, uh, Chinese, uh, in the Chinese Inner Mongolia uh, province. There are about 5 million speakers of uh, Mongolian today. I think about uh, 3 million within the borders of Mongolia and about 2 million uh, uh, around. Uh, this is Khalkha, uh, Khalkha Mongolian. You have also other types uh, of Mongolian, for instance, Buryat, which is uh, spoken uh, around Baikal uh, here in Russia. There's a very aberrant uh, Mongolic language, Dagur, that has long been classified as a Tunguzic language because it resembles uh, the Tunguzic languages uh, so much. That is probably due to intensive borrowing with these Tunguzic languages that are, that are all situated here in this area. And then uh, uh, you have, uh, these are all uh, Eastern Mongolic languages. And then you also have uh, Western Mongolic languages like Oirat here in uh, Brown. And one uh, language, Kalmuk, that is uh, closely related to Oirat, that is spoken on the Volga and that uh, separated from Oirat in the 18th uh, century when there were some people flooding here uh, to the west. Another very aberrant uh, conservative Mongolian language is Mughal. Mughal is uh, spoken in Afghanistan by only perhaps yeah, less than 1,000 people. Um, but uh, today people have no access uh, to Mughal because of the situation in Afghanistan. And as I was uh, making this book, I was uh, searching for uh, people who could contribute uh, a chapter on Mughal, but it was very uh, difficult. Uh, one professor, Professor Wires from Germany, uh, is already long emerited and was too old actually to, to still take it uh, on. He excused himself and then we had another uh, uh, expert who was uh, very ill at that time and now we are practically without expertise uh, in Mughal. Uh, this is uh, uh, really unfortunate because Mughal is a very conservative Mongolic language and can thus reveal something about the ancestral stages of uh, uh, Mongolian. The periodization of uh, Mongolian we have a very rich literature in Middle Mongolian. Middle Mongolian was a language spoken by Genghis Khan, who lived in the 13th uh, century. Um, one of the most well-known source, uh, sources written in Middle Mongolian is The Secret History of the Mongolians, which is the bi bibliography of uh, Genghis Khan. It was written in the 13th century, but we only have access uh, to it through a copy uh, that goes back to the 17th uh, century. And then there is a classical modern Mongolian, and then uh, we speak of a contemporary Mongolian in the 20th century. Here you see uh, Genghis Khan. We don't know exactly when he was born. Um, here uh, you also see this whole uh, empire of uh, Genghis Khan and how far it really went. Actually, the, uh, the uh, ancestors of the, the tribe, the original tribe of Genghis Khan, was uh, situated to the east on the border between 
Russia and present-day Mongolia. And uh, it's only with the expansions under Genghis Khan that it uh, went more and more uh, to the West. It, it actually went so far as uh, Europe. Uh, the sources uh, we have for Middle Mongolian is our inscriptions, like a very early Yis Yisunge uh, inscription. We have, as we said, the secret history of the Mongols, which is the most famous uh, book. Then there are many administrative and religious uh, documents. There are letters, belles lettres. Uh, for instance, one uh, sent uh, to Philip's, uh, Philip the Fair of France when, uh, Jing when the Mongols were on the borders of Europe. Uh, there are bi biographical inscriptions, Buddhist texts, uh, translated Chinese non-Buddhist works, and, and also lexicons in Chinese Mongol or Arabic uh, Mongol. So we have uh, quite a lot of uh, literature for Middle Mongolian. Here is such an example of a letter that was sent uh, to the uh, king of France. You could ask yourself, how oh, has the king <laughs> deciphered that? at that time. Uh, but um, uh, so fortunately, a lot of, of uh, big uh, Middle Mongolian literature. As for the classification of Mongolian, again, most people agree that all Mongolic languages are related. The only There are only minor disagreements on how exactly to classify them. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, all the all Mongolian we discuss today goes back to Middle Mongolian, just uh, similarly as, as what we uh, discussed for Korean with uh, Shila Korean, Middle Mongolian is also a kind of bottleneck. It was the language of Genghis Khan who unified uh, Central Asia, not only, linguist not only politically, but also linguistically. So all other pre-existing Mongolic languages uh, went uh, down, or they they all got lost without leaving much traces. There's one other Mongolic language that left some traces, and that's the language of the Kitan, uh, the Kitan who ruled China in the during the Liao Dynasty, and go back to the Tabgach. We have some words of Tabgach. Uh, uh, preserved in Chinese historical sources. And uh, just in the last five years, uh, perhaps, Kitan is getting deciphered. So we find inscriptions in Kitan and uh, uh, gradually they are getting reconstructed. So we, we really get uh, not only a picture of Kitan, but also because we have a sister language of Middle Mongolian, we using Kitan, we can reconstruct Proto-Kitan Mongolic. So suddenly we can go back deeper in time, uh, which is very welcome, of course. Uh, and here is uh, the classification proposed by Nuchteren in the uh, Trans-Eurasian book. As you see, it's... Uh, Similar to the standard uh, classification, only he splits, uh, he separates Dagur immediately from Middle Mongolian and Mughal immediately from Middle Mongolian. So they they are they have a more outlying status as in uh, the previous classification. And then the structure of Mongolian, uh, we the, the Mongolian uh, structure is, guess what, morphological structure is agglutinative, as it was also for Japanese, Korean, and Tunguzic. Uh, Mongolian is also dependent uh, marking throughout. So if you say my mother, you will say mini ish. Uh, I genitive mod mother, so the e the uh, is marked on. Uh, the dependent, not on the head. And then the syntactic structure is SOV. So in Khalkha, you have Mur, Zagash, uh, Idesh, Bain. The cat eats uh, fish. With Mur is cat, Zagash is uh, fish, Idesh is the eat, and uh, the lexical verb is before uh, the auxiliary B. And then we have our last uh, family that we are going to study uh, in this uh, seminar that we are going to compare to Japanese, and that is the Turkic uh, family. Here you see the distribution of the Turkic languages. 
when we uh, think of Turkic, we often think of Turkish, uh, uh, which is a a, um, a north uh, or a south western uh, Turkic language. But there are many different uh, Turkic languages, as you can see, at least 20 different uh, languages that go all the way here from uh, Europe uh, in the West uh, to here Yakuts and uh, Northern Siberia in the East. Uh, we divide uh, the Turkic languages in four groups. There is a... Uh, northeastern group of uh, Siberian Turkic languages with uh, languages like Yakut, the language of the uh, reindeer breeders and Dolgan, and then a few small uh, Siberian Turkic, southern Siberian Turkic languages like Shar and Tofan and, and so on. And then you have uh, uh, here uh, South Eastern uh, Turkic languages like Uzbek and Uyghur. Uyghur, uh, you might have heard from uh, the Uyghurs, are the people who live in the Tarim Basin in China and who are there treated as a real uh, minority. You have these camps uh, for Uyghur uh, people. So that are the Uyghur. They speak a Turkic language. And then you have the... Uh, South Western uh, Turkic languages uh, that have Turkish, but also, for instance, Uzbek or Tur Turkmen spoken in Turkmenistan. Uh, and then you have the Northwestern uh, Tunguzic languages. For instance, there's also Karaim, which is still spoken by a small co community in Lithuania uh, today. There's one aberrant uh, Turkic language uh, that is uh, Chuvash, which is here spoken on the Volga, whereas all other Turkic languages are Eastern uh, Turkic languages or belong to the Eastern branch of uh, Turkic. There's only one living uh, relative of the Western Turkic branch, and that is uh, Chuvash. So in this sense, Chuvash can te tell us as much about Proto-Turkic as all other Turkic languages uh, together. So for historical comparative linguistics, uh, Chuvash has a very uh, big importance. The periodization of Turkic, we, we speak of all Turkic in the period between the 7th and the 14th century. So the oldest uh, Turkic written sources uh, go back to Old Turkic. They were found uh, in, in Mongolia's Orkan Valley. So uh, the Orkan Valley is a little bit uh, southwest of Ulaanbaatar. Uh, we now picture that as Mongolia, where people speak Mongolian. But in the 7th century, that was territory where uh, Turkic was spoken. So the stone steels we find in Mongolia... Uh, in the Orkhon Valley are written in Old Turkic. Uh, there's also Karakanit uh, Turkic, which is the Turkic of the 13th, 14th century, and the first Islamic Turkic uh, language. It's the, the language of Mahmoud al-Kashkari's uh, Compendium of Turkic Languages, which is a kind of Arabic uh, Turkic lexicon. And then uh, as uh, Genghis Khan is uh, moving uh, west, uh, Turkic uh, people also get more and more uh, mobile and, and move uh, across the eastern and the western steppe. And in the 14th and 16th centuries, we see that uh, um, a number of um, literary monuments of Turkic, um, of Middle Turkic, come about, like Chagatai Turkic, Kipchak Turkic, the Turkic of the uh, Codex Comanicus, and Old Anatolian. And then we have a, a period of the 16th to the 19th century, which we call pre-modern uh, Turkic. And then we have modern Turkic starting uh, from the 20th uh, century with 24 written languages, all depending on what you call a language and what you call uh, a dialect, of course. The sources we have are the inscriptions in runiform script in the Orkan Valley, also in the Yenisei Basin. They go back to the 7th and the 10th century. Then we have old Uyghur manuscripts uh, from the Terem Basin in uh, China, in uh, Uyghur and in uh, a number of uh, scripts. Um, 
and then we have texts uh, from the Karakhanid state in Arabic uh, script in uh, Xinjiang. Here you see a picture. Uh, we say change is gradual in the beginning. It's, uh, I think, 15 years uh, ago. And, and when I see that picture back, I think oh, I became old. Uh, but uh, this is in front of uh, this uh, stone steel in Mongolia. At that time, actually, I was teaching in Mainz. It was one of my first years that I was teaching in Mainz. And I had a, a class, I think, Einführung in die Kritische Altaistik, it was called. And in that class, uh, there were two uh, Mongolian students. And uh, we went to Mongolia, and their uh, uncle and father uh, had a jeep, and we uh, crossed Mongolia uh, with uh, their jeeps. At that time, there were no real roads uh, towards the Orkan in inscriptions, so we went to visit them, like crossing the steppe, like that. Uh, these uh, scripts, uh, the scripts used on these inscriptions are called runic uh, script. Uh, however, they have nothing to do with the old Germanic, the uh, runes. They just look a bit uh, like them. Here you see some, yeah, here you see a bit text in, in this old Turkic runic script. Uh, the script is similar to these runes as we find them uh, in Old Norse. Uh, here a, a picture from a, a, a steel in Uppsala in, in Sweden. Uh, but they have no connection to them. It's just like a coincidental uh, look-alike script. And that is why uh, they were the, the Turkic script was co coined runic uh, script. Here you see a classification. Yeah, there are many uh, Turkic languages, so it's a bit tiny, tiny. The important uh, thing about uh, Turkic uh, classification is that you have here this Chuvash uh, language that is the only living uh, the representative of this branch, uh, which is uh, the uh, Bulgar uh, Turkic uh, branch or the West Old Turkic branch. All the other languages go back to East Old Turkic. There are other classifications, uh, also these Bayesian classifications that are uh, trendy now, um, uh, together with uh, a postdoc in our team, Savelyev. We check the classification uh, using Bayesian statistics, and the classification was more or less confirmed. Uh, some branches came out differently. For instance, the Khalaj branch uh, came out on another position, but there are no like big uh, differences. And then finally, the structure of uh, Turkish, as all trans-Eurasian languages, structure is agglutinative. The morphological structure is interestingly not dependent marking, but double marking. So Turkish has both strategies in one. So it would say odanun kapus, the room genitive door uh, third uh, singular possessive. So of the room the the door thereof. So you have two markers uh, to express possession: one on the dependent, one on the head, and that's why it is called double marking. Uh, one of the reasons why the Turkic languages may shift from uh, um, dependent marking to double marking is probably their contact with Uralic uh, languages in the area and these languages are double marking so they probably take the same uh, type of marking uh, from the Uralic languages so that's an influence and then the uh, syntactic uh, structure of Turkic is also SOV uh, again the same example sentence Kedi, Cat, Balak Fish, yeyor, the cat eats fish. Just notice that uh, what we have seen uh, today is that there are written records for the trans-Eurasian languages. Often people say, yes, but this language family is almost, it's almost impossible to study it or to prove it or to demonstrate it because of the total lack of written records. But note that that is not completely true. 
Of course, there are no written records that go back to the uh, centuries BC, but we do have written records. We should not forget that the old Turkic inscriptions go back to the 7th century AD, just like uh, Japanese, uh, the old Japanese Manyoshu, for instance, this big anthology of poems with many, many volumes goes back to the 8th century AD. And then you have some languages that are somewhat later, like Middle Mongolian, but are very well attested, 13th century I, uh, AD. And then, of course, you have uh, languages like Middle Korean, 15th century AD, although we have earlier sources, but more fragmentary. And uh, Manchu, 17th century AD, although we have er earlier sources like Jurchen, but also a bit more fragmentary. So it is certainly not correct to say that there is a total lack of written records. Of course, in comparison to other language families like Indo-European, the written records are later. However, note that for many other language families in the world, like Austronesian or even Sino-Tibetan, we do not have that many uh, written records going back that early too. So we are quite on the, on the good side uh, there. And also, if we compare with written records for establishing Indo-European, we see that indeed in Indo-European there are some branches or some languages that go back very deep in time, like uh, Hittite here, 1900 to 1100 BC. That is almost that's the second millennium BC. That's incredibly early, like uh, Greek. Uh, 1500 BC, Avestic, 800 BC, Ionic Greek, uh, 800 BC, Sanskrit, 600 BC, 500 BC for Classical Latin, and so on. But there are also Indo-European languages that are attested rather late, 250 AD for Tocharian, uh, 400 AD for Gothic, the oldest written source for the Germanic languages, and 800 AD for Old Church uh, Slavonic. Note that this is about the time depth of uh, Old Japanese, and still we can uh, we can establish these families. So uh, the lack of written records or the poorness of written records should cer certainly not be an, an, an objection to uh, study the relatedness of the trans-Eurasian languages. So, um, yeah, I think we have uh, timed it very well. This is the end of the uh, seminar. Uh, I thank you for your attention, but if you have questions, feel free uh, to ask them, and if not, uh, feel free to leave, and I will meet you then next week uh, for the next seminar. Thank you very much for struggling through the difficult reading uh, today and for being so uh, attentive in spite of this bit uh, difficult medium. I really appreciate it. So bye and feel free to ask questions until uh, uh, four o'clock. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.